Hello everyone and welcome to AISC's Night School. This is Night School 7, Stability Design of Steel Structures, Applying Modern Method to Structural Analysis. Presented by Donald W. White and Ronald D. Zemian. Today is January 26th, 2015 and this is Session 1, Modern Methods of Structural Analysis, Part 1. Tonight's session will be presented uh, by Dr. Ronald Zimian. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating tonight's presentation. I want to introduce this evening's speaker, Ronald D. Zimian. He's a professor at Bucknell University. He received his BSCE, his MENG, and his PhD degrees, all from Cornell University. In addition to authoring papers on the design and analysis of aluminum steel structures, Dr. Zemian is the co-author of the textbook Matrix Structural Analysis and the editor for the sixth edition of the Guide to Stability Design Criteria for Metal Structures. He is currently the treasurer and was the former chair of the Structural Stability Research Council, and he's a member of AISC's Committee of Specifications, where he chairs Task Committee 10 on Frame Stability. He also recently completed his term as the chair of AISC Task Group on Inelastic Analysis and Design. Dr. Zeman also serves on the AISI and Aluminum Association Specification Committees and is active with the Steel Joist Institute. Dr. Zeman has been awarded with the ASCE Norman Medal in 1994 for his paper on Employee Advanced Methods of Inelastic Analysis. He also received an AISC Special Achievement Award and the ASCE Shortridge Hardesty Award. We're very pleased to have Dr. Zeman here tonight. Thanks for being here, Ron. I'll hand things over to you. Well, thanks, Brent. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, from a very snowy Bucknell University campus. Well, first, it is great for the Structural Stability Research Council to be joining AISC and delivering this night school course. Uh, in SSRC's first night school course a few years back, I indicated that due to time limitations, we could only provide a brief overview, in fact, less than one lecture on system stability. So it is awesome now to have eight lectures to cover a topic that is so essential to the design of steel structures. Now, Don and I have decided to focus on the subject through the lens of an engineer who has access to modern methods of structural analysis. So the session topics over the next eight lectures are going to include, first, I'll go, and uh, actually the first half of tonight's lecture is going to be really a course uh, overview, a course introduction, sort of setting the stage to, for the relationship between modern methods of structural analysis and the direct analysis method. Uh, then I'll, I'll follow up tonight with getting started on what exactly do we need by modern methods of analysis, and that is how does the computer actually get the answer. Uh, now, I'll only be able to get to the first portion, a first-order elastic analysis, by the end of tonight's lecture, and then I'll transition over uh, to uh, looking at nonlinear analysis, both material and geometric and nonlinear analysis next week. Uh, the third uh, session we'll go through and I'll provide you some neat resources for better learning structural stability. And then I'll hand things over to Don. Don's going to come in first, giving us an overview of second-order analysis and sort of the ins and outs, and then uh, with respect to a practitioner, and then he's going to have a full lecture on the direct analysis method, and actually a few more. The third, the number six lecture here, he'll focus on low and medium-rise steel buildings, and then in his seventh lecture, uh, we'll be focusing on advanced applications of the direct analysis method and stability design. And then I'll come back and finish things up, uh, taking it one level further, and that is actually how might one design and what are the rules for designing by inelastic analysis. Uh, so again, it's great for Don and I to be joining AISC and especially on behalf of, of SSRC. So like I said, um, I'm going to first take uh, the next 30 or so minutes and uh, give you sort of a course introduction in background. Um, our story really starts by this figure in the lower right here in 2005. And what happened then when AISC came out with the 2005 specification is uh, something sort of pretty, pretty interesting finally occurred. And what that was was the word analysis finally entered the specification. So it hadn't been in the specification up to this point. 
Uh, but now the word analysis comes into the specification. And so the whole concept of structural design becomes much more than proportioning. The structural design includes not only the proportioning or what we conventionally call design, but also includes analysis. And it's now all being recognized uh, within the, uh, the specification. I always like to start the, the lectures with you know, just a steel building, something to look at and think about. Um, now, one of the neat things about structural steel uh, or a few neat things about it anyway, are, are its strength to weight ratio. Um, when you actually do the math, and I just did this a few days ago with my students, and compare it against that of other materials, say concrete, on a strength to weight ratio, we're about four times better than those materials. Now, when you also consider the awesome stiffness to weight ratio, and again, we're coming in about three times that of concrete, uh, things are really looking good uh, for structural steel. Now, of course, we've got to watch the price, and so we need to come in at competitive pricing. And when you combine the three of these, what you end up with are very slender systems in members and even slender cross sections. And as we are aware, when you have something that's very slender or fairly slender, the mode of failure is often buckling. So the name of the game in structural steel is often designing for stability. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, the real emphasis here. And as a practicing engineer, you really have to you know, not be an expert in it, but you need to get your head around it in order to design nice, happy, efficient structures. Now when it comes to um, stability, uh, I think what I want to do is just step back and, and sort of set the stage by looking at two what I would define as buckling design methods. And I'm going to go through this figure with you, but I, what I want to first indicate is that this figure applies equally whether you're considering a system, a member, or even a cross-section. Right? So, so what we're about to undergo here is not just limited to my example, and I'll just take a column, but it could be you know, a three-story building as well. All right? So on the horizontal axis, what I'm plotting here is, let's say, deflection. So if we're considering a compression member, a column, let's consider maybe halfway up the column the lateral movement, the side-to-side -side movement of the vertical column. On the vertical axis, what we're going to do is start applying compressive load on that column. All right. So if we were to follow a very traditional sort of what we learned back in solid mechanics, Euler buckling approach, um, this is what I would be calling a biification kind of theory, as it's shown in red here. So as we apply the compressive load, um, the column is perfectly straight. That's how we have assumed it. And we apply more and more load, and nothing happens. The column doesn't bend or do anything until finally we reach this point in which we reach, let's say, the buckling load. And suddenly the column buckles, and we get an unbounded amount of deflection, and the, you know, the column has failed. So that's all well and good, and I'm going to identify that as sort of bifurcation theory. And so bifurcation theory is, is very binary. Either the column is not buckled or it is buckled. All right? And like I said, it equally applies to a system. Either the system is not buckled or it is buckled. Uh, but let's return to the column. So now let's compare this against what I'm going to define as instability theory. And instability theory uh, basically, what we do is, for simplicity, let's start with a more realistic column that is not perfectly straight, but has some type of an initial imperfection in it. All right? So we start down here on the deflection side, and I've shown it large, so, you know, but the deflection is, is actually very small, but it's there. And so what happens now is we start applying load, and life is good, the column's doing fine, but as we start to really apply a significant amount of load, the column starts to bend. And that midpoint, that mid-height deflection laterally starts to get more significant. And as that happens, and we put more load on there, the structure, or the, let's say in this case the column, is actually going to start losing stiffness. As it loses lateral stiffness, the deflections laterally be, start to increase. The deflection laterally starts to increase. Then the column starts bending even more. As it bends more, it loses more stiffness, more lateral stiffness. The deflections grow, the bending increases, and pretty soon what's going to actually happen here is this green curve, as we put more and more load on, the deflections again start to become unbounded, and 
the limit load of the column will actually uh, approach, asymptotically approach, the answer of which the bifurcation theory would have given. All right? So that's the, the two approaches, bifurcation theory or instability theory, bifurcation, buckled and not buckled, instability, sort of a gradual buckling that starts as a result of some type of bending. And in our case, we use some type of an initial imperfection. So now when it comes to a general stability design methods, all right, um, the reality of the situation is, and I'm showing you here sort of the fundamental LRFD equation in blue, we're saying, you know, of course, the required strength needs to be less than the factor design resistance. All right? And this, this equation needs to be satisfied uh, when we look at equilibrium on the deformed shape of the structure. All right? And uh, so in two worlds, we have the effective length method, and that is based on bifurcation theory that I was talking about before. And then we have this new thing, or at least relatively new to the industry, called the direct analysis method. And this is not based on bifurcation theory, but based on instability theory, as I defined it in the previous slide. Now before moving to the next slide, it's just really important to note that the inclusion or the consideration of second order effects is not new. It's not a, you know, oh boy, we've come out with the direct analysis method and suddenly we need to formulate equilibrium on the deformed shape. That's always been the case. All right? And it was the case with the effective length method, and it's now the case with the direct analysis method. So one more slide uh, on the effective length method. Again, as I said before, it's based on sort of you know, this bifurcation theory, binary buckle. It's either not buckled or it is buckled. <clears throat> so um, the key to the effective length method is, of course, making sure you've got the correct uh, the correct effective length. All right? So this is where that K factor comes into account. And that K factor, or KL, the effective length, is the only device in this whole world here that's accounting for um, all the factors or effects known to impact system and member instability. All right? So we've got one, one device here, the K factor for each one of the columns, and that's sort of controlling or representing all effects known to impact system and member instability. Now, life is good as long as you've got the correct effective length factor. All right? And uh, so I can't bash the effective length factor and say it's a horrible method. No, it's a very good method. It just requires you to make sure you are using the correct effective length factor. All right? And in fact, this method has been proven acceptable and quite useful for nearly or over 50 years. All right? uh, but <clears throat> our story starts with the fact that we have been concerned of whether or not the engineers have been comfortable and confident in getting these effective lengths or these K factors. And so that's been sort of the driving um, reasons for looking at the direct analysis method. Now I'm going to divide our worlds up a little bit. The first thing I'm going to talk about, and you see up in the top in quotes there, I'm going to talk just about the general direct analysis method. All right? So the direct analysis method is not just something specific to AISC. Uh, it's used in all different types of metal structures, aluminum. Uh, the coal form folks are adopting it. I was just giving a workshop in Hong Kong. They're going straight out with the direct analysis method. So I wanted to sure first give you sort of the big picture of it, and then we'll specifically focus on, on AISC's take. So the basic concept is that by directly modeling effects known to impact system, member, and cross-section instability, then what you're going to get here are some simplifications. All right? So by directly modeling effects when you compute the required strength, you're going to get some breaks on the right-hand side on how you compute the design resistance terms. All right? And again, this whole direct analysis method approach is based on what I was showing you earlier, this approaching buckling, this small imperfection or bending that grows and grows as you uh, put more and more load on the structure and it approaches its limit state of strength. Um, now it's important to note that this process in itself will not permit system member and cross-section instabilities. So just the basis of how it works, we, we, we won't be going on to the wrong side or anything. It, it generally works, all right? and it works very well. So first, uh, a quick review on what are the effects that are known to impact system, member, and cross-section instability. 
So first we'll identify the effects, and then we'll show, them, show you how they are accounted for in the direct analysis method itself. So what are the primary effects? Well, first, of course, the given applied loads on the structure and the relative stiffness distribution or with, you know, in resisting these loads are, are key. Um, but another, a few very important ones are the fact that the, both the system, the building, and the components, the members or cross sections, are not perfectly straight. They have some amount of an initial imperfection. And we're going to include these because, again, we're using this instability theory uh, to, to sort of replicate what we had been doing with the effective length method. Um, now, another primary effect is yielding. All right, so as our structure reaches its limit state of strength, we're getting yielding. We know that there are residual stresses in the members. They can be significant on the order of about 30% of the yield strength of the material. So that yielding would be accentuated by residual stresses if they're there. Um, certainly, all pertinent resulting deformations, whether they're axial deformations, bending deformations, shear deformations, second order deformations, all of those are certainly driving uh, this sort of instability that could occur. And even within a system, there's going to be a redistribution of stresses or forces and moments that are going to result from a change in the relative stiffness distribution as, for example, yielding occurs and the like. So those, those are the primary effects. All right, so now let's switch over uh, to AISC's direct analysis method. So the first thing that AISC is going to do is we're not going to worry about cross-section instabilities. All right? Our focus, and I'll show you some new stuff coming tonight, is going to be both on system and member, um, modeling system and member instabilities. Uh, by and large, in the hot rolled industry, our sections are not very slender, often compact, and so we're not going to play in the cross-section world. But if you went over to FinWall, AI, AISI, with their direct analysis method is most likely someday soon going to include looking at cross-section instabilities as well. So we get a little bit of a break there. All right, so first the analysis. All right, so the analysis is a key component of the, obviously, direct analysis method. All right, so getting the forces that we're going to actually design the structure for. So I like to uh, first you know, follow our specification, and it's really divided into two parts. The first part would be designing by an elastic analysis. All right? And the second part is you go back to Appendix 1, and there's all the rules laid out for you for designing by an inelastic analysis. All right? But if you really start to think about the direct analysis and method and what we're doing, even though we say, oh, we're doing an elastic analysis, but we do a couple of little tricks. And in doing those little tricks, what we're effectively establishing is what I might call a poor man's inelastic analysis. All right. And a poor man's inelastic analysis, how we're getting there is we're actually requiring you to reduce the stiffness of the members in the system by a factor of 0.8. And in fact, a 0.8 on top, and we'll, you know, throughout the next few weeks, we'll talk more about the details of this. But there is a reduction in member stiffness right from the get-go that in many ways can reflect inelasticity. The other thing we're required to do uh, is include system, and depending on which of the subcategories of the direct analysis method you're using, also include member imperfection. So I'll qualify this in a bit. Um, now, the one thing that when we do design by elastic analysis that we don't allow is for any redistribution of forces or anything like that. Now, if you uh, decide, well, I'm going to be a little bit more advanced, and I'll use a, an inelastic analysis. Well, now you're directly modeling the loss and stiffness due to yielding. All right? So that does not need to be accounted for by use of a 0.8 or anything like that. It's directly included in your analysis. Uh, system and member imperfections would be directly modeled. And the real benefit now is if you're actually capturing this yielding and you're getting the second order effects that are, you know, are connected to it as the yielding grows, deflections get bigger, second order flex get bigger. If you're getting all of this, then you are actually now granted the opportunity to account for the force redistribution that will occur as yielding occurs in the structure. So those are the two basic categories designed by elastic analysis and designed by inelastic analysis. And by and large, our world as structural engineers focuses on the first part. But like I said, we're also going to try to give you some information uh, th during this lecture series on the second part. All right, so 
so at this point now, let's hone in on elastic analysis. All right, and I'm going to talk to you about AIC's kind of basic uh, choice in the direct analysis method. It's what appears in the body of the specification. Um, it's been around, uh, recognized by AIC since 2005, and we're just finishing the balloting now on the 2016 specification. And of course, it's going to be there. In, in, in life is good. So uh, with respect to directly modeling effects within the analysis, um, again, as always, you need to include the applied loads and the stiffness distribution of the structure. Uh, but here, we're only talking about modeling the system imperfections, all right? the fact that the structure is not built perfectly straight up and down, not built perfectly plumb, but it has some small amount of initial imperfection sort of reflective of what the code of standard practice might, might permit. Um, as far as the yielding, that was another one of those effects known to impact system, uh, impact system and member instability. Um, that yielding, again, we're going to capture by using a 0.8 on tau factor, all right? and of course, including those pertinent deformations. So by using a nice, happy, second-order elastic analysis, including these effects on the front end within your analysis model, then as I'm saying down here in red, you get some simplifications. And the key simplification that you're granted is now that the flexural compressive strength, the P sub n, can be based only on the unbraced length. So no need to calculate a k factor. Um, effectively, what we're saying is you get to use k equals 1. All right? But it's a lot easier now for the engineer to look and not try to second guess what should the k factor be and have the guilt conscience of how important this k factor is, because it's representing everything and instead simply be able to use the unbraced length, but they've got to make sure that on the front end they've got a good analysis set up and it's accounting for, for these effects that I described above. So that is your sort of general run-of-the-mill AIC direct analysis method. Now what's coming in 2016 is kind of exciting uh, because it's going to provide a, a, a unique opportunity, not for all structures, but uh, for, for some very uh, maybe more difficult structures to understand. All right, so here, what we're going to be doing is now, what are we directly modeling? Well, everything before from the previous slide, the initial imperfections in the system and the yielding. So we still got the 0.8 on tall, and we still have the initial out of plumb that we're accounting for. Well, we're going to take it one step further, and we're actually going to model the member imperfection, the fact that the member is not straight, and we're actually going to build into our computer model some type of a sweep to represent the initial member imperfection. So now that is obviously quite time, time consuming to do, so you wouldn't be doing this routinely. But for some special structures, and I'll show you shortly, uh, this is a real sweet alternative. Um, so what are the simplifications granted? Well, this is actually very interesting. Um, the simplification is, is when it comes time now for you to calculate the compressive strength, you don't go to chapter E. You don't need to use the column curve. Because the analysis has yielding, a you know, poor man's yielding accounted for, it's got the member and the system imperfections, what you actually can use as the compressive strength piece of it is the cross-sectional strength. And if you have a nice, happy, um, compact section, we're talking about multiplying the area times the uh, yield strength of the material. And uh, so that is a lot easier to do, but you're paying for it pretty significantly and making sure you include both system, member, and imperfections, as well as that 0.8 on top. And then, like I said before, the, the last option of the direct analysis method is to do a full inelastic analysis. And uh, this uh, our group brought forward and officially came out in print in 2010. And again, it will be in the code in 2016. That will be shortly forthcoming. Um, and again, you're modeling, as I said before, system, member, and directly modeling yielding now. So your program actually has the ability to directly model yielding and the redistribution that would occur as a result, as a result of portions of members yielding. And uh, you, so you're getting a very, uh, I'd say, almost exact solution. You're really representing what would happen if you brought the structure down into a laboratory. Uh, but it's a bit of an expensive analysis, but uh, it's nice to do if you've, if you've got that opportunity. And here, the simplification is even further, um, almost like the previous slide with what I was calling the direct analysis method in modeling member imperfections. Here, 
uh, you can actually waive specification design equations. So no longer needing to satisfy the column curve or the beam equation or the likes. If your program has the sophistication to do that and it's modeling the inelasticity correctly, um, you, basically you're running a virtual lab to see how the structure will perform. And the really nice thing is you can you know, go well beyond that first plastic hinge and allow for the redistribution that would actually occur as the structure reaches its limit state of strength. So a few uh, additional thoughts on this. Uh, first, our groups and AIC is not uh, you know, trying to come up with the ultimate automated modeling and analysis you know, world. Uh, we're not trying to replace engineers, not in any way. What we're trying to do is provide more opportunities for better engineering. All right? And so again, we're trying to improve the design process by providing a more detailed and hopefully more realistic understanding of structural behavior and not hiding behind, let's say, K factors or something like that, which may or may not be fully understood by the profession. So when uh, an engineer now approaches the specification, they sort of, uh, you know, they, they need to w sort of take a temperature, take the temperature of where their confidence level is. All right? So I've kind of created my own scale down here. And so what we can imagine is that we have some type of a given design situation. Right? I, I don't know what it is, and I'll show you a couple examples. But let's say you've got some structure. And you look at that structure, and you're getting ready to attack it and design it. And the question is, is does its geometry lend itself to the prescriptive equations in the specification? And if your answer is yes, then you have a lot of confidence that the specification equations are the ones you want to be using. And hence, you really don't need to use that sophisticated of, a, of an analysis. All right? so, now, if you're not so sure about those equations, were they really created for this? I feel like I'm getting out of bounds. Then you can switch over and start to directly, more, directly model more and more the effects that impact stability through so using a more sophisticated analysis, and you can go that way. So we're trying to sort of open up the, the range of possibilities for the, for the engineer. So here is uh, my first example in using this sliding scale. Um, it's a pretty, I just stole a picture off the web, so if this is your structure, I apologize for not giving you credit for it. But, um, uh, so here is a, you know, a, a, a multi-story building. Um, the geometry looks fairly orthogonal. I, I think it's a pretty nice, you know, it does have some nice curves and some decent overhangs. But I think by and large, this kind of structure would lend itself quite well to the prescriptive specification equations. So it would be this type of a structure fairly routine, if you will, that either the effective length method, or if you're having trouble figuring out what the correct effective length factors are, or you want to just get out of the effective length world, this is a great one also for the direct analysis method. Now, if we start to consider some more interesting structures, at least maybe we could say more difficult to design structures, well, we've got some uh, ones that I've sort of stolen uh, pictures from. and, and um, the first, let's see, this top one here uh, looks like some type of an airport terminal. Um, look at these columns. All right? These are what we call tree columns. They're not certainly your conventional column. The column comes up, it spreads out, spreads out again. A similar action over here is another tree column that sort of comes up and it goes around this skylight. So the engineer is sitting there thinking, and then another engineer has to design this arch down at the bottom. Well, man, how, all right, let's suppose we were doing any one of these structures. I want to do the direct analysis method, but I don't even really know what the unbraced length is. So this would be a situation where the engineer would now have the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to, I don't have a lot of confidence here. I'm going to take the one step further away from, say, the column curve, and I'm going to directly model the member imperfections in these columns or tree columns or the arch. And by doing that, all I will need, I'll let the analysis sort of sort out the instability, and I'll just need to check the cross-sectional strength. So there's you know, less confidence in the actual code equations and more confidence uh, in, the, in the structural analysis. But clearly, you know, the structural engineer needs to know what they're doing with this structural analysis. They cannot be using it as a black box. But we have a lot of great structural engineers out there who are more than qualified to do this. The final one uh, is an example here I'll steal um, that uh, 
we've got um, a structure here, a beautiful building, and there's an atrium underneath it. And the architect, of course, well, most architects, I'm sure there's architects on the line, but they, they hate columns. They want the ultimate amount of flexibility, and that often causes a tension between architects and structural engineers. Uh, but so here is a case in point. They wanted the building behind it to be able to see what was in front of this building. And so a minimum amount of structural steel was needed. So the decision that was jointly reached between the engineer and the architect were to use these things called tree columns. Right? Now, a tree column is basically a traditional column, but it doesn't really have a web. So you start to think, all right, no web, tree column. Does that even come close to what would happen in the AIC column curve? No, probably not. So this would be a situation where the engineer could, if they wanted to, move forward and actually go for a full-blown inelastic analysis to design those tree columns, I mean those uh, ladder columns. So that's what we're talking about here, is just providing more opportunities. And I've sort of tried to walk you through um, sort of the history of when direct analysis first appeared. It, in 2005, and it was back in Appendix 7. It was well received, and as a result of that, in 2010 specification, it was upgraded uh, to Chapter C, but it was also extended in 2010 uh, to uh, include inelasticity, and that resulted in a fully revised Appendix 1. And now in 2016, we're still going to have those two versions of the direct analysis method available, but we're also going to have one additional method called direct modeling of member imperfections where if you do this correctly, under the rules that are provided, uh, you can drop all the way down to on the design resistance just having to check uh, the cross-sectional strength. So to sort of put in things in perspective, in summary, um, let's go through each one of the methods one more time. Let's consider a beam column. So we have a structural member that's subject to both axial force and bending. If we were to check this according to the AISC specification in LRFD, this would be the key equation that we would use. We'd use the interaction equation. And there's two key terms in here. Um, you know, the, the top part is the required strength, all right? so the required axial force and the required bending moment. That would be coming from the analysis. And in the bottom, in the denominators here, is the axial strength and the uh, moment strength. All right, the design resistance terms. And you have to satisfy this interaction equation. Now, if you use the effective length method, again, you'd do a second order elastic analysis. Uh, you would use the full E, no initial imperfections or stiffness reductions, and your analysis would give you an M sub U. But when it comes time to calculate the, um, the design resistance strength, you would have to include a K factor to account for the potential instabilities that may occur. And so you go to the column curve with a KL, and most likely your K is larger than 1. Now, if you move to the sort of introductory level, the basic level of the direct analysis method, here, again, a second-order analysis is used, but you're reducing the stiffness of the structure here by a 0.8 in TA, and you're also uh, including a frame out of plumb. All right, so the building isn't perfectly straight. And the two of these are going to produce larger moments. So we're going to get a larger M sub U, uh, so there's more demand. But at the same time, we're going to provide you more capacity by not requiring that you, you know, to use a K factor. We're going to let K go to 1, and, uh, and you can use the unbraced length. If we go one step further and actually include the member imperfections, all right, uh, so now not only do we reduce E by 0.8, we include the system imperfection, and we include the member out of straightness, what that's going to tend to do is even make these moments even larger. All right, so now we have more demand on the structure coming from our analysis, but at the same time what we're doing is providing more cross-sectional strength uh, because we're not requiring you to use the column curve and a reduction due to the unbraced length. We're actually allowing you to use the cross-section strength. So it really all comes down to a big trade-off, if you will, on how these methods actually work and why they all often give very similar results. Uh, if we take a look at the lower left, you know, it's kind of strange, but yeah, as we move from the effective length method to the direct analysis method to the direct analysis method, including member imperfections, we are, with each one of these steps, significantly increasing the uh, design resistance or the compressive capacity of the, of the beam column. 
But at the same time, as we're doing that, we're also increasing sort of the what's going to be included in the analysis. And the more we include, it's not good news. We're reducing E. Oops, let's see. We're reducing E, and we're including either system imperfection or both system imperfection and member imperfection. So those are driving up the moment demands. When as a result of that, um, you know, you know, you're, you're getting strength, and you're increasing the required strength. There's really a, a trade-off, and in most cases, um, the methods will give very similar designs. Um, but again, there's just situations in which it's very difficult to apply the direct analysis method and forget about the effective length method where this direct modeling of member imperfections really comes in handy, like I said, for an arch or these tree columns or what have you. Um, so that's the first part there, Brandon. That's really what this whole course is going to be about. I'm going to go on now and focus on the analysis side. Uh, but before doing so, I figured I'd uh, take a breather here and, and see if uh, you have any questions for me, Brent. Okay, Ron, thank you. I, we do have a couple questions before we move on. Um, I guess just to, just to follow up to reemphasize this last slide, is one of these methods, does it result typically in more conservative results than another one, or does it just really depend on the structure? I guess um, I, I would say you know they're all conservative, they're all safe, they're all you know we've, we've tested them all out. They all work. Uh, the one that's probably going to give you the most efficiency, or if you want to use your words, the least conservative, is the direct modeling of the member imperfections. All right. So, uh, but again, you're really squeezing it but it's at a cost. You've got to include the imperfections in all the members, and this is quite tedious to do. But that would probably be the least. Um, the the, the age-old game between the effective length method and the direct analysis method, uh, I think uh, we have shown time and time again, they give very similar results. But the problem is, as long as the engineer got the correct effective length factor, the correct K factor. and. Uh, my, my gut feeling is, is uh, that's not happening all the time, where the direct analysis method is just a lot more streamlined, and it takes away that element of hoping that you got the correct effective length method. So certainly if you got the wrong effective length, uh, conservatism or whatever, is, it doesn't mean anything. You, you're simply uh, out to lunch. So. OK. Um, next question, could the direct design method be used for checking a beam or truss that is being lifted by a crane during erection? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I won't mention any names, but that is very popular <laughs> right now. And in fact, um, the, the method that they're actually employing to do this is the bottom one here, this direct modeling of member imperfections. All right, so you've got this sort of strange thing going on. Um, the truss, you know, you, what you've got to get right is what the imperfections look like um, or, or the initial bending as you lift that truss off the ground. And um, so it's, it's very nice to be able to, to use that. So yeah, it, it, it's one of its big uses, in fact. Yep. OK, uh, with the direct analysis method, you talked about you, uh, you reduce your, your E with 0.8 times tau. And one question that came up is, can you explain where the 0.8 came from? <laughs> uh, the million dollar question. Um, all right, I can give you a, a little bit of history there. Um, probably the, 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 the first, the answer to that question is, is in the commentary. Okay, I, I wrote up the few paragraphs that are in the commentary. Um, so I really. Uh, get the best answer, go to the commentary in, in Chapter C commentary, and you'll find the response to that. Uh, but uh, one, one way of thinking about things is for a very long, slender column. Um, if you think about the fact that you know, in the column strength, we've got a 0.877 factor. All right? And you think about the fact that we have a 0.9 uh, P factor. If we take the two of those and multiply, multiply them together, uh, we get a number very close to 0.8. So that, in a way, is sort of accounting for the member imperfection that would be occurring in the direct analysis method. 
Now I have to say that uh, when the direct analysis method was being, uh, you know, formulated in AIC's version, uh, Don White and I, both in separate worlds, uh, Don's PhD student uh, Andrea Sarvak, and my uh, master's student Jose Martinez, in separate worlds uh, investigated exactly what would be the correct factor to use, and we both kind of jointly came across the same thing. And for minor axis bending. We were suggesting to AIC a number like 0 0.75, 0 0.78, 0 0.75 probably too, too much, but about 0.78. But for major axis bending, it was about 0.83. So the, uh, we put that forward to this, the committee, and the committee said, no, wait, no, no, let's not have separate numbers. So they just basically used the average, and it, it, it does a fine job. So, but um, anyway, that's uh, the quick answer. But the, I think the best answer is, is what I've got. Uh, laid out in the commentary. Okay, very good. Um, let's let's move ahead, and then we'll uh, we'll address some more questions at the conclusion. Okay, so um, again, um, this whole concept of the direct analysis of that method is is pretty much the guts of this course, or at least several of Don's lectures. So we'll be coming back to that. But I think if there's one thing you, you might appreciate is that as we move forward in providing the engineer more opportunities, um, we need to make sure the engineer is up to speed on their structural analysis. And they're not just treating the, uh, the computer analysis that they're doing most likely as a black box. So that's what I'm going to try to do here is to give you um, a little bit of background. Now I only have the remaining portion of this lecture and next lecture, and I've got a lot to cover. So there's just, you know, there's no way after this lecture and a half you're going to be able to go out and write a computer program to do it. But that's not really what we're after. What we're after is to get maybe a mindset and what to think about um, and the critical questions that should be going through your mind uh, when you're using this modern methods of structural analysis that is a computer analysis. Now, uh, for many people, the role of the analysis is simply to just run the analysis, get forces, moments, and deflections, plug them into design equations, and see does it work or doesn't it work. And, and so they're just using it for proportioning structures. And, and that's fine, uh, but what we find is the engineers who are really producing very interesting structures and very efficient structures are using the analysis also as a tool for providing insight into the behavior of the structure. And so with a better understanding of that behavior, they're actually producing a better design. And that's really what we're after, anywhere from using these nonlinear analysis methods right through the, to the direct analysis method. Now, one of the keys that we have to understand is that we have moved to a limit states design specification. You know, concrete did it a million years ago. Steel is finally doing it now. And so we have this load and resistance factor design, LRFD, and it's all based on the fact that you're designing for the limit of resistance of the structure. So when the structure is fully loaded with all those factored loads and it's going to fail, I think we realize that there's going to be a significant amount of nonlinear behavior. That nonlinear behavior is going to become geometrically large P delta effects. Um, it's going to come from yielding, hopefully no cracking. If it was concrete, it would be crushing. But from material effects, so if you had a composite structure, um, certainly the, the remaining two there. And really, um, the yielding produces larger deflections. The larger deflections produces larger second order effects. So these things are, you know, it's really the combined effects. But this is a very nonlinear problem. And you've got to think about, all right, it really lends itself well to a nonlinear analysis. Uh, so again, just some of the reasons why it's so key that uh, I'm glad you're attending our night school course and hoping that you'll you know, continue to study this subject if you're not already uh, well up to speed on it. But nonlinear analysis from the design standpoint, you can see coming down the top, AISC, uh, you, you know, we've got the direct and the two versions, or three versions of the direct analysis method, um, you know, anywhere from the traditional version, including member imperfections, to inelasticity. The seismic world, a big jump when they started using pushover analysis. Now many of the seismic community are starting to use full nonlinear time history analysis. All right, so this, this is really exciting in providing those engineers some real good background into how their structure behaves in a seismic event, uh, but it requires their engineers to understand nonlinear analysis. 
And then, of course, even topics like progressive collapse, you pull away a column, you're asking or some, a few columns, how does the structure fail? You've got to do a nonlinear analysis to sort that out. All right? A linear elastic analysis is not going to tell you anything. Um, now, one of the nice things that's happening is, is the software, with almost every passing year, is becoming more and more sophisticated and providing you more and more available nonlinear analysis capabilities. Research has always been based on nonlinear analysis. And on the education side, uh, we're starting to see more and more graduate level courses, not only on computer analysis, matrix structural analysis, but also taking it to the second course in focusing on nonlinear analysis. So these are all good things and uh, good reasons to um, start getting your head around nonlinear analysis. Um, so the, um, the concept of linear to nonlinear analysis, we could probably break it into two worlds. The first would be hand methods. All right? So I would, with respect to second order effects, I would classify these as the B1 and B2 factors, uh, moment amplification factors. And the, uh, with respect to material nonlinear, I would think of the hand methods of being something that was occurring in the late 60s and early 70s called plastic design. All right, and some of you out there will remember the days of coming up where your, your, your professors say, tell me all the possible plastic mechanisms, and you'd spend all night identifying 50 of them, and then you would find the one that produced, you know, that would occur at the least amount of load, and that was your controlling mechanism. So, uh, but these weren't fun things to do, and um, the, the focus of at least tonight's lecture and next week's lecture is, is going to be on the computer methods. All right? And uh, there's lots of variations, especially when it comes uh, to nonlinear. But they really all use the basic, same basic concepts, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Now next week, I'll go into some detail and uh, actually uh, have a look at a program that, that I've prepared called MassTan2, and just kind of give you the background to how it works. Um, commercial codes are, are using very similar approaches. Now, the one thing that you've got to keep in mind, especially when we transition into nonlinear analysis, is that all of these methods are approximate. All right? And uh, so they are not a substitute for engineering, but they are very much intended to be a complement to good engineering. So they're going to make you a better engineer. All right, so an overview. Uh, like I said, tonight I first introduced the course. Now I've given you a brief introduction of why we might think about nonlinear analysis. And I'm going to get started tonight, but I won't finish, uh, in heading in the direction of, of nonlinear analysis. But first thing I want to do is sort of lay the groundwork on how does the computer get the answer, so a computer structural analysis. For many of you, this is a review. Uh, it's going to get a little tedious, and you may run out of the room screaming. Hopefully not. But uh, what I hope y y you stick around for is just getting the big picture. And I'm going to try to give that to you. The slides are going to get a little busy but I think you'll get there. Um, the second lecture, next week's lecture, is really going to go in and take what we learned this week and show how those programs are modified to account for material nonlinear effects and for second order effects. And then we'll provide a little bit of discussion on MassTan and some concluding remarks. So that's, uh, that's where we're going. So how does the computer get its results? And uh, does it use a state-of-the-art crystal ball? No. Not at all. all right? So I feel like a person that has, you've been seeing ma perhaps magic tricks on your computer screen for years, and now I'm going to tell you how the tricks are done. All right? and, and really, what's happening here uh, is there are basically two requirements that are being applied. All right? And the first one, as I'm showing here, is equilibrium. All right? So equilibrium simply means that all the forces have to be in agreement with one another. All right? It has to be in, let's say, static equilibrium. And when we do equilibrium, we end up with a bunch of equations. And these are equations are in terms of forces and moments. All right? And that's fine. Uh, unfortunately, for a lot of the structures, especially statically indeterminate structures, that will not give us enough equations. So we swing around and we start to think about compatibility. Well, what are compatibility equations? Well, compatibility is sort of the sister to equilibrium in which compatibility isn't talking about forces and moments being consistent with one another, but it's talking about displacements and rotations being consistent with one another. So that will give us a bunch more equations. 
And the great news is, is by the time we combine our equilibrium equations and our compatibility equations, we'll have enough equations to actually solve the problem. The problem, though, is that the equilibrium equations are all in terms of forces and moments, and the compatibility equations are all in terms of deflections and rotations. So we've got enough equations, it's just that some of the equations are in terms of French, and other equations are in terms of Spanish. So we sort of need to decide, are we going to solve this term? Which language are we going to solve it in? All right. So that's where I sort of um, have defined what I might call a translator. All right. So this is a device that's going to be, allow you to move either from deflections to forces, or in reality what we will do is move from forces to displacements. Now this translator is simply what you might have heard as an undergraduate uh, constitutive relationship, or more simply put, Hooke's Law. We don't tend to work in terms of stresses and strains. We tend to generalize this re constitutive relationship to relating forces and displacements. Right? So F equals K delta. So what we'll do is once we have this force-displacement relationship, we will rewrite the forces and moments in our equilibrium equations in terms of these displacements, or these unknown displacements. And once we do that, we'll finally have a balance between the number of equilibrium equations. Now, they're kind of funny looking equilibrium equations because they're in terms of displacements. But it will equal the number of equilibrium equations we have will equal the number of unknown displacements. And like any good engineer, you remember all your undergraduate days in graduate school, it seemed like that's all you ever did was try to come up to that magic point in which you had the same number of equations as unknowns, and you could finally smile, roll up your sleeves, and solve the problem. And that's effectively what the computer is doing. So what I thought would be kind of fun is if we took this very simple example and sort of walk through and laid it out for you. And you'll see that even using a very simple example, you know, the, the mathematics that I show get fairly complex. But you've got to remember that the computer is doing it. So you don't need to do this by hand. You just need to understand how the computer is getting there. All right? So let's take this uh, simple truss, a three-bar truss. Uh, these are just axial force members. And uh, the only point in this truss that can move is point D. And the only movement it can do is left to right or up and down. So let's focus on this and draw a free body diagram. Uh, the applied forces on the structure is we've just got 40 kips to the right and nothing vertically. Uh, but uh, the other forces that are acting on this point D are member forces. All right? So if we take truss member AD, it has axial force in it, and that axial force is aligned with the orientation of the member. But if we actually resolve the axial forces at the end of that member into its two components, one in the horizontal direction, shown in green, and the other in the vertical direction, shown in blue, we've now got the two forces. Those two forces coming from the member act equal and opposite on the node. And so we basically take this force and say it's the same amount of force pulling down on uh, point D, this force at the end of this member is pulling to the left. And what we're going to do is basically visit each one of the members. We'll resolve its end forces into two components, a horizontal and a vertical, and we'll show them as acting equal and opposite on this point D here. And introduce the last member, member CD. And now we have, if you will, a complete free body of that, that node D. And that's really the only one of interest in this very simple structure. So what can we do with that? Well, it's time to write our horizontal equilibrium equation, so some of the forces in the x direction. So the red arrow has to sum to the green arrows. And then we can sum forces vertically. Now we have no applied force vertically, so the applied force is 0. But these member forces have to balance each other, be consistent, so that they do total 0. So we've got our two equilibrium equations, and uh, we're off and running. Now, the next step then is to actually introduce this translator. Like I said, we're going to take those member forces and we're going to convert them to displacements. So what we can do is we can take, in this case, a, a, just a simple axial force member, and we can find out what are the forces that develop on the end of this member if we were to deform the ends of the member by some amount at each end, a vertical amount of movement and a, vertic a horizontal amount of movement and a vertical amount of movement here at end i, and likely a horizontal movement or a vertical movement at nj. So what is the relationship between these displacements 
and the forces that would develop. And uh, we could write those equations, and they would look like this. All right? So yeah, that's kind of scary. But uh, that's not what I'm after here. I'm after the big picture of just letting you know that we can rewrite these member end forces in terms of member end displacements. And a key part of this is we're rewriting them in terms of the stiffness of the member. All right? So where do those stiffness coefficients come from? Well, first, they are known. That's the good thing. Um, but they are a function, of course, of the material properties of the member and the geometric properties of the member and also the member's orientation. So we'll have a look at that uh, in more detail after we get, sort of get through the big picture of this example. All right, so again, from this slide now, we have the ability to go from member end forces and rewrite them in terms of member end displacements. All right, so we would do this for each one of the members. All right, so all right, so step up. Here's member AD, and we would write it in terms of the member end forces in terms of those member end displacements. And again, these stiffness coefficients are known. And they are a function of the properties of member AD and its orientation. And then, sure enough, we could write a whole bunch more equations. All right, another four equations representing the four member end forces and the four member end displacements for member BD. And we could write it the same for member CD. All right, so I know you're thinking, all right, things are starting to get really busy here. But no, I'm just trying to show you that we would do this, or the computer would do this, for each one of the members. Now it comes time to, to, to do a substitution. Now keep in mind, here was our equilibrium equation, and it was in terms of the member end forces, the member end force for member AD, BD, and CD. And if we go back to the uh, previous slide, those are right here. Here's the member end force for member AD. Here it is for member BD. Let's see, actually, we've got to get it to DN. So here it is for member AD, for member BD, and over here for member CD at the D end. And um, so what we can do then is write each one of those member forces. You know, from the previous slide, we can grab the one that rewrites it in terms of deflections. And so what we're going to do is a substitution. And voila, we get an even uglier equation. So I know you're thinking, all right, he's been drinking at dinner. Is this going somewhere? No, it is. It is. Just hear me out. Um, again, the computer has no fear. It's just going to set up these giant equations for you. Now we're going to have a vertical equilibrium equation as well, and we can rewrite each one of the member end forces in terms of their member end displacements. We've already done that two slides ago. We're just grabbing the key equations. And now we have our equilibrium equation vertically in terms of these member end displacements. So where are we at? Well, at this point, it seems like I've made things really complicated for you. We had two, and we still have two equilibrium equations. They were originally in terms of member end forces, so they were kind of scary. Now they're in terms of member end displacements and known stiffnesses. All right, again, the stiffnesses are known because we know the properties and orientation of the member. And uh, so the problem is, is we're not done. And so what card haven't we played yet? All right, so I can hear my students yelling across the hall there in the classroom watching, and they're all screaming compatibility. And uh, good for them. Indeed, we haven't applied compatibility yet. So, and again, what compatibility means is that we have deflections that are consistent with the connectivity of the members and how the members are connected to the, to the supports. So with respect to the member-to-member -member connectivity, again, I've been showing in those earlier slides, um, let's take this amount, the deflection uh, U in the, the, the horizontal deflection at point D at, at point D uh, at the member at, for member AD, and here's the deflection at point D for member BD, and here's the deflection in the horizontal direction for, at point D for member CD. Now these values are not different. They're, the member is all connected together, so those three deflections are not three different deflection values, but they're all the same number. And the same thing for the vertical. So we're going to get some simplification happening pretty quickly in which all the horizontal deflections at point D are the same value. And all the horizontal vertical member end deflections are the same value. So we've got UD and VD. All right, now, if we go down to the base, we've also got compatibility between the member ends and the support conditions. All right, so these supports, we've got no deflections at them. They're rigid supports. So a bunch of these member end deflections then are going to be zero. 
So we come back to that ugly set of equations I showed you before, and we substitute in now uh, for the deflections uh, that we now know. And um, so these, all of these deflections, let's say any horizontal deflection at point D uh, has to be the same value. So they're all of these are the same deflection, let's say UD. And all of these are the same deflection V sub D. Um, and then these, all of these deflections, well, these are all the deflections that occur at the base of the element. And the element is tied to a support condition. The support condition doesn't move. So all of those, those deflections are 0. So OK, life is looking much better. We can now simplify our system of equations to something that is still a little bit scary, but not so bad. And we've finally got this down to two equilibrium equations, that which we started with, and two unknown displacements. And that's the displacement at point D, both horizontally and vertically. And again, these member stiffness coefficients are all known, and they're a function of the member properties and its orientation. So uh, we're, we're there. We now have two equations and two unknowns. We're psyched. We can solve that. And indeed, we would solve for our unknown displacements and we would get the, the two deflections. All right, so now we've got the deflections. Once we have the deflections at point D, we know the deflections at points A, B, and C. They're all 0. So we know the deflections everywhere in our structure. All right? If we know the deflections everywhere in our structure, then we can return back to those member force displacement equations, uh, those force, yeah, member force displacement equations. So for example, here's member AD. We now know everything on the right-hand side. We now know all of these deflections. So using that kind of crazy-looking set of equations, but again, the computer's doing it, we can calculate the member end forces. And we can do that for each one of the members. Again, knowing their deflections, we can calculate the member end displacements. So I'm not looking for you, again, to program this. I'm looking for you to just get an appreciation for the big picture of how the computer is getting the solution. All right, so a summary of the computer approach, uh, it formulates for each what we call displacement component or degree of freedom an equilibrium equation. So we're going to end up with a whole bunch of equilibrium equations, one per degree of freedom. We're going to write on the force side the member forces. We're going to rewrite them in terms of their displacement components. And that is through a stiffness equation. So we're going to need to compute the, the stiffness coefficients for each member. We'll rewrite it. We then make a substitution, like I showed you, of these values in for the member forces. Once we do that and simplify using compatibility, so incomes compatibility, um, we can, are going to then have a balanced number of equations to a number of unknowns of which we can solve. Once we solve for them, we can then use those stiffness equations back up here. We've got all the displacements. And we can now solve for the member end forces. All right? And if we want the reactions, we can go one step further and uh, use those original equilibrium equations. If we were to rewrite them now down at the supports, we could actually get the reactions. All right? So again, um, I don't have expected you to memorize this or anything, but look back at these slides over the upcoming week. Th this, is, this is how it's done. All right? So lots of questions. So is this? how most commercial programs such as SAP 2000, RISA, STAT, Strand 7, I'm sorry I couldn't list everyone's program out there, but yes, 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 this is how they're all getting it. All right? And it's called the direct stiffness method. All right? So this is how they're all doing it. Should all such programs give the same answer? Another yes, as long as, so here's the fine print, you're doing a static first order elastic analysis. So no no second order effects, no yielding, and you should get there. Now, a lot of people will pick up a program and then compare it against another program, and they don't get the same answer and what's going on. Nine times out of 10, what it is is one of the programs, the default, is to include shear deformations when you actually calculate the, um, the stiffness coefficients. Um, just make sure it's turned on on both programs, and if it is, you should be getting the same answer. And if you're not, don't go further <laughs> until you do. All right. um, now, uh, it's interesting to note that this is indeed the basis for the, what is called the finite element method. All right. So we are doing the finite element method here, no doubt about it. We're using very simple line elements.
But if you move forward to shell elements or 3D brick elements, it's all the same game. In fact, the only thing that's tricky when you move to these more sophisticated continuum elements is how do you get the stiffness coefficients? And they typically also work instead of forces and displacements, they eventually work in terms of stresses and strains. But it's the, it's the same basic thing, and again, it's called the finite element method. So let me take a sip of water. So two big questions then should be sitting in your mind, and that is where do these stiffness coefficients come from? All right? And that's what we're going to talk about. And they're, absolutely, they're the key to the game. And the second is, is what happens if we do a nonlinear analysis or even a dynamic analysis? And the answer on that one is quite simply that the exact same approach is used, but often what we do is we apply the loads in increments and we perform a series of those analyses. So we put a little load on, do one of the analyses, get the results, put some more load on, do another analysis, add those results to the previous one, and just keep marching along. All right, so so this, this is the key, and like I said, it's those stiffness coefficients that, that we're after. So some important points. The, the only opportunity for most computer software to model the actual behavior of the structure is through member stiffness terms. All right? So you want to include first order effects, you know, your EA over L, uh, your 12EI over L cubed, all your favorite terms. This is how you, you want to include bending. The only way to do it is through those stiffness terms. All right, you want to include semi-rigid connections, you're going to do it through the stiffness terms in the program. So with these programs are stiffness based. Uh, you want to include second order effects. How do I do that? Somehow, if the second order effects are due to compression, which will tend to reduce stiffness, you need to be reducing member stiffness as a result of the presence of, let's say, axial force. If you've got yielding, you need to reduce member stiffness as a result of the yielding. So you don't have 12 VI over L cubed, your full bending stiffness, you have some reduced amount. All right? So the key here is the member stiffness, the stiffness coefficients are the, you know, are the basis for the analysis, and um, that's how you're going to get to nonlinear. So let's review member stiffness, and then we'll call it a night. Uh, so first, very simple, all the way back to your high school physics experiments when you used to use a translation or an extension spring. And, uh, what we're going to do here for each one of our cases is monitor on the horizontal axis displacement and on the vertical axis force. All right? And I'm going to do this is very simple tonight, but I'm going to continue this example uh, next week. So here we are. Uh, we've got our spring all lined up, and we apply some force to the end of the spring. Of course, the spring stretches. All right? So over on the left here is we have the response curve. We applied force, and the spring stretched. All right? And the slope of that response curve is the stiffness. And we know from our high school physics days, F equals KD. All right? And K was the spring constant or the stiffness of the spring. So all of this is the stiffness world here. So now, depending on what high school you went to, certainly not my high school, but uh, there, there is a, a you know, more advanced uh, type of spring. And that would be what we would call a rotational spring. And um, so a rotational spring, just a simple example, would be that which holds together an old clothespin or um, you, you, you heavy-duty weightlifter types. You're often trying to build up the strength of your hands, and you're squeezing these devices. And if you look at the end, there's a rotational spring at the end of those. And so it's the same basic concept as an extension spring, but instead of applying force and getting displacement, what we're going to do is apply moment, and we're going to get rotation. And once again, if we plot the response this time and you know, monitor rotation for a given amount of moment, we're going to get a relationship between that moment and that rotation of m equals k delta, uh, m equals k theta. All right? So this would be the rotational spring stiffness. So we have extensional springs and rotational springs. And what I try to do now is, all right, let's, let's get to reality, and that is actual structural members. So we've got an axial force member. All right, so here we've got an axial force member. Um, you know, I'm showing it here. And what I'm going to do is apply axial force on this structure. And when I do, of course, the member is going to stretch by some amount delta. So over on the left, here is, again, the stiffness of that member. We've got displacement and axial force. And that the stiffness of this axial force member, as you're well aware, 
is a function of its area, its cross-sectional area, and its length. If we increase the cross-sectional area, we increase the stiffness. If we increase the length of the member, we decrease the stiffness. Likewise, the material property. Okay? Uh, if we use a stiffer material or a less stiff material, it's going to have an impact on the axial stiffness of the member. So, and that's represented by the, the modulus of elasticity. So you probably realize that this relationship is EA over L. Good for you. But all I'm really looking for you to know is that it's a function of those properties. And what we're going to look at next week is how these properties uh, are reduced and hence impact the stiffness of these members. How about real members? Well, we've got two types of flexural members. One, a member being subject to an end moment. And on the right here, a member being sub subject to a, a shear force. And I know you're already thinking, okay, I know the relationship on the left one is 4EI over L, and I know the right one on the right, the stiffness is 12EI over L cubed. Good for you. But I'm not looking for you that level of precision here. What I'm looking for is just for you to realize that the flexural stiffness of these members is a function of its moment of inertia all right, and its length. And again, increase moment of inertia. You increase stiffness, decrease it, you're going to lose stiffness. Increase the length, you lose stiffness. And of course, it's also a function of the material stiffness. And so we can think then on the left is really an example of a rotational spring where on the right, that example is really more reflecting of a translational spring. All right. But, so, all right. Um, so other factors, so beyond just the geometric properties and the material properties of a member, there is one more important factor that impacts stiffness. And it's important we realize this because when we go to a second order analysis, the orientation of the members is going to change. A once vertical member after some loading is not going to be so vertical anymore. And it's going to become less and less vertical as we apply more and more load on it. So the, the orientation of the member can impact uh, the stiffness. So uh, on the lower left here, very simple axial force member. It's, I've taken the axial force member. I've made it perfectly vertical. It really has no horizontal stiffness and plenty of vertical stiffness. If we switch the picture and have the member run horizontally, the axial force member has no vertical stiffness, KV is zero, but it's got plenty of axial stiffness, you know, or horizontal stiffness of EA over L. And then if we move one step further and start to think about members that aren't vertical or horizontal, but at some type of an incline, then, for example, this one on the left, the horizontal stiffness is a function of the orientation of the incline, all right? and it's proportional to the cosine of that angle. The vertical stiffness of the same member is also proportional to the, uh, the incline, all right? and it's proportional via the sine squared. All right? So the important point here is that the, just in general, not even as specific as this sentence, but the orientation of the member will have an impact on the stiffness that we're looking at. And for example, the less vertical a member, the less stiffness it has to resist vertical loads. So let's start wrapping things up in first, um, you know, just sort of work through the world that I'm trying to emphasize to you right now. And that is, you know, this is what you see. You see a steel structure over on the left here. We've got all kinds of environmental loads, heavy winds, wind, whatever you've got, uh, snow tonight, uh, rain. Uh, over on the right, who knows what kind of gravity load is going to be on your structure. Uh, but that's, that's sort of the reality of what you see. And then you take that structural system and the loads, and you model them in the computer. And most likely on your computer screen, what you see is a whole collection of elements. And these elements are all being interconnected by common nodes, and that's how all, the whole structure is tied together. But what your computer sees is actually something quite different. What your computer sees is a whole bunch of interconnected springs. All right. So these are those rotational springs and horizontal springs and vertical springs that I was showing in the previous slides. And what your computer program is doing is what I showed several slides ago, and it's taking all of these spring stiffnesses for each one of the elements, and it's combining them all together to give you a system of equilibrium equations all right, that are in terms of unknown displacements. And then your computer program is solving it. So. Uh, to sort of summarize tonight's lecture, 
um, at least the second half. Um, what I tried to do in enough detail for you to get the big and most important picture is how the computer program is getting the answer. So we reviewed what, it's called, what is called the direct stiffness method. And again, it's basically using equilibrium and compatibility. Unfortunately, the equilibrium equations are all in terms of forces and moments. The compatibility equations, which are awesome, but they're all in terms of displacements and rotations. We need one consistent set of units, if you will. And so what we decide in the direct stiffness method is to solve in terms of displacements. Uh, the key to that is the structure and its behavior is being controlled by the stiffness, all right, by the stiffness of the members. So think of them as springs. And when I say, all right, I'm going to now include material uh, nonlinear, I'm going to include yielding, what you're going to be actually doing is softening the members. You're going to be reducing their stiffness to reflect the fact that in reality the member is yielding. Uh, so tonight we covered first order elastic stiffness. Um, it always can be divided really into two parts. One, the material property itself. And so the key component here is the modulus elasticity, uh, at least for axial force and bending. If this was shear or torsion, the key material property would be the G value. Um, now the other side of this is not only material, but the geometry properties of the member. And that would, of course, include its cross-sectional area, its moment of inertia, its length, and just as importantly, its orientation. So the next step then in all of this would be to transition into looking at nonlinear analysis. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to do that tonight. Uh, so we'll start that up next week. And so I'll be back uh, joining Brent. And time to go nonlinear. And basically what I'm going to use is this direct stiffness method, and I'm going to show you how these commercial programs you know, work with respect to this direct stiffness method and, um, and how we can go nonlinear and how we can include second order effects and how we can include material nonlinear behavior. You know, right? And um, so hopefully that will get you up and going. And I think at this point, uh, Brent, I'll turn it back over to you for some Q&A. Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, we do have time for some questions. We do have a handful of them out there, so uh, we'll do our best to address these at this time. Um, the first question is in regards to the direct analysis method. Can we use the direct analysis method in a building with step columns, such as in an industrial crane building? How should we address the design of this type of column using the direct analysis method? Okay, uh, first, yes, uh, the direct analysis method can lend itself to that. The second part is, is, is would require a very detailed answer and sort of description, much more description of what we're looking at for the geometry. I think, though, as this person follows this course, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of light shed by Don White's analysis on this topic, um, especially in those lectures six and seven. Uh, so um, let's, uh, I'm not even going to try to answer it besides to say that it is a good one for the direct analysis method. And I think uh, maybe Don won't exactly you know, do these crane columns, but I think through some of his examples you're going to get a feel for the different types of complexities that the direct analysis method really lends itself to. Okay. Uh, next question. <clears throat> How would lateral torsional buckling type effects be considered in the DMMI or DM method? <laughs> that is an awesome question. Uh, I laugh because uh, we just spent uh, a significant portion of the fall semester uh, doing a, a huge study on this. And um, Brandy, I don't know if you have access to that person's email, but I'd be more than glad to send them a copy of the report that uh, we put together. But the, uh, what we found is that uh, programs uh, can capture uh, lateral torsional buckling. Uh, I will demonstrate to you that on the third lecture, when we have a look at these stability learning modules, one of them, a key part of it, is to actually capture lateral torsional buckling. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, but I, I do want to say one thing about that exact topic, and that is, um, 
if you are going to try to capture this with DMMI, you need to have a program that is more sophisticated than just the ability to do a routine P cap delta and P small delta analysis. Now, you need a program that is going to actually, as you gradually put the loads on, actually updates the geometry and accounts for the member twist that's occurring and can gradually find itself into a lateral torsional buckling mode. All right. Uh, so that's a key part. Um, whether the program includes warping resistance or doesn't, if it's just based on same for not torsion, if you've got warping resistance in there, it's going to be your, your best friend and, and get you a lot more strength. Um, if you don't and everything else is working well, um, then you're just going to be uh, conservative. Um, you, you know, it, it won't provide you the, the added benefits of warping resistance. So I think um, it definitely can do it. And, uh, but uh, again, a sophisticated method of analysis, and I can't wait to show that to you uh, in action on, um, on the third lecture when we look at the learning modules. Okay. Um, well, I can definitely follow up with you with that email address for that report. Um, next question, um, is it possible to check the DM or DMMI computer output with some representative members using approximate hand methods or hand calculations? Uh, good question. Um, I think the, the, the check that would be going on with the hand methods or the like, uh, uh, really what Don is going to try to do in Lecture 4, um, He's going to try to show you, or he will be showing you, um, how to use you know, B1 and B2 factors, what they're good for and what they're not good for. But uh, the, the key there is not so much the direct analysis method, but how you accounted for second order effects. And how significant were they, and did I get them, and all of them, with my nonlinear analysis program. And so he's got um, some tricks up his sleeve in showing you how to use these moment amplification factors to sort of get that assessment. So I, I think with respect to the direct analysis method, um, if it's going to, if you're concerned, it's funny, it's really not the method, it's the analysis that was used to get the results that's going to cause you some head scratching and, all right, did I get this right? And uh, is there a way to sort of double check on that I got the second order effects uh, correctly? And that's where these, you know, these tricks that Don will show you with the use of moment amplification factors um, are, are quite useful. Okay. Um, next question is, when designing using the direct analysis method, is it acceptable to use initial out of straightness an initial out of straightness that exceeds the typical AISC limits, if in fact the straightness is modeled exactly. Well, uh, again, um, I might be not fully understanding the question, but the um, the intent, uh, if you actually read, and this is even in the current chapter C, is that the amount of initial imperfection you're supposed to include is what you would expect. All right. And so what was, ever, what was documented in your agreement when you designed the structure? And so those are the initial imperfections. Uh, now, as, at a minimum, uh, we would hope that you would be using what you know, the code of standard practice would limit. But certainly, if you include larger initial imperfections, and these initial imperfections are, in fact, causing more trouble, you're not you know, putting them in a direction that favors or offsets loading, but actually causes more trouble. Um, my, my gut feeling would be the larger imperfections you use, the larger the forces or overturning moments you're going to need to design for, and um, so you know it, it, it can't hurt. You know, uh, if you want a more efficient structure, then you you would probably want to get those initial imperfections as close to uh, what what will be in the field. Okay. Uh, Back to this reduced stiffness. Does the point zero point eight tau apply for any metallic material? Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, so just uh, to take off my steel hat and put on my aluminum hat, so there we've switched materials. 
Um, the point eight, um, the the, um, the aluminum specification, uh, one really weren't sure what to do. I did a study for them, and in the end, to be just consistent with the education and the steel design thinking, uh, they adopted to use the point eight on TA. Uh, the point eight, I think, does the trick for them. I think the the question is whether the TA should be there or not. Uh, the TA is often thought of as reducing the cross-section strength due to the existence of, um, of residual stresses. And when you fabricate aluminum structures, or at least you, they're, they're extruded, they don't come out straight, and the first thing that they do is they pull them straight. So they actually do a giant tension test, and when they pull them straight, they really pull all the residual stresses out. So the question on the aluminum side is, do, should they, do they need the top factor? Uh, probably not but they have elected to go with it. Uh, the folks at AISI, um, they have uh, always argued about the point eight, and I believe they don't use a point eight. Um, I'm getting a little tired here tonight, but I'm pretty sure in the ASI, they went with a point nine instead. Uh, but I don't know if that's in print or coming out soon in print. But, uh, so. Okay. And then as a follow-up to that, there was a question about the tau factor. Can you, can you just explain once again what the definition of tau is. Okay. Uh, the tau factor is a stiffness reduction factor. Um, in its most simplistic form, uh, what you can think of is a, a let's say, an eye shape or, or cross-section. And we know that after the shape was rolled and set aside to cool, it didn't cool evenly. All right. The segments like the flange tips, which have lots of uh, area, exposed area, uh, cooled first, and the intersection between the web and the flanges cooled last. And uh, once something cools, it sets. It, it also, first it contracts and then it sets. So the flange chips contract and set. The interior wants to continue to contract before it actually sets because it's cooling at a slower rate. It wants to contract, but it can't, so it ends up in tension. And as a result, those flange chips end up in compression. It's not a small amount. The amount of it, those flange dips can be as much as, like I said, 30% of the yield stress of the material. So now when you start squishing, let's say, a column, um, you don't just get a uniform yielding. What yields first are, let's say, for example, the flange tips. And so you start yielding those. Now you have a structure that's partially yielded and uh, you know, more susceptible, if you will, to buckling. So that's what that top factor is after is to sort of capture that partial yielding that's occurring as a result of these residual stresses being there and sort of you know, reducing the amount of stiffness that you have or resistance to buckling. So as a quick answer, uh, again, uh, Brent, if you had the uh, email on that one, uh, that was summarized in a few slides in our night school course that we gave last time for you folks, but I'd be more than glad to send those a couple of slides uh, showing that math uh, to the, to this person asking the question. Okay, sounds good. And then um, we're about we're about done here with time wise, but uh, yeah. just a couple more questions. Is the reduction in stiffness then is that applied only to columns or both columns and beams? Okay, so this point eight factor uh, needs to be applied to any and everything that is providing uh, resistance, uh, uh, providing you stability, all right? So providing you, let's say, lateral resistance to the structure falling over, all right? So the 0.8 factor should be applied to the column stiffness. If you've got a frame in which the beams and the bending of the beams are, you know, big players in the lateral stiffness of the structure, then, yeah, you should be applying the 0.8 against the beam stiffness. Uh, if you have connections, all right, and you're modeling the connection stiffness, the 0.8 should be applied against those as well. Again, if those connections are part of the system, the lateral system, that's keeping the frame stable. So it's pretty much anything that's providing the stability, uh, you need to be hitting it with that 0.8 factor. Okay, and then lastly, we've had a couple questions uh, in regards to additional resources. Can you, can you recommend um, a good textbook or other uh, material or reference that would be a good resource for second-order analysis 
the direct analysis method, uh, principles of structural stability, et cetera? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess the, maybe in fairness, let's just stick with the two that Don and I have worked on. I mean, there's, there's lots of great books out there. Uh, but instead of trying to list a bunch and forget somebody's and they'll, they'll be upset with us. Uh, first, with respect to Don, uh, Don White and Larry Griffiths uh, recently came out with an AISC publication, Design Guide 28. Uh, that is very nice and very thorough in providing uh, some great background to the direct analysis method. And so it's from cover to cover, all about the direct analysis method, and lots of examples and lots of background. And so it's, it's almost a required, core, uh, required text for our course tonight. Um, the second one, I'm almost a bit embarrassed to, to pitch uh, because it's my own book. Uh, but the reality of it is um, it's a, it's the title of the book is Matrix Structural Analysis. And I think it really has some real nice chapters uh, in the middle that were written by Bill McGuire and myself on nonlinear analysis. In, but it's targeted, again, not to someone who's going to program, but someone who's going to be applying these computer methods. So again, the name of that book is Matrix Structural Analysis. But um, there's one really important part of this that I'm not embarrassed to pitch, and that is you can download it for free um, at the MASTAN2 uh, website. So if you Google MASTAN2, you'll find my MASTAN2 site. On there, you'll find a tab to the textbook. And you can download it, or through Amazon, right next to nothing, you can purchase a print version. And so I think between those two, because I know the design guide references the matrix book, uh, and, and you know the design guide you'd have to purchase through AIC. The matrix book is free. Uh, you, you'd have two excellent resources and, and be on your way. Okay, very good, Ron. And that uh, wraps up tonight's session one. So thank you, Ron, and. Thank you all for attending. I do want to go over our, our CEU process one more time. In package attendees, we issue a single certificate for the entire course, so you'll need to hold tight to the conclusion of the entire eight-session course. Additionally, for the, that eight-session package, you also have access to the quiz and recordings. Uh, the quiz will be mailed to you by uh, Wednesday. I apologize this, this uh, slide this is Thursday. But the quiz and recording email will go out on, uh, by end of day Wednesday. That will include a link to an online quiz as well as access to the recording. Um, some more information on the quizzes, um, why you want to take the quiz. If you are interested in uh, earning the EEU, uh, the EU recognizes those that put in the time and effort to uh, fully um, participate in this course. If you attend all the sessions and pass seven of eight quizzes as well as pass the final, you will be given the EEU. So if you want to work on earning that EEU, you have to take the quizzes. Additionally, if you watch the recording instead of the live session, you have to take and pass that quiz in order for PDHs. And lastly, we encourage you to do it for the sake of reinforcing what you're learning in these sessions. So um, that being said, if you do attend the live version, which is on Monday nights, you do not need to pass the quizzes in order to receive your PDHs. So again, look for that quiz and recording email uh, by end of day Wednesday, and those are for the eight session attendees. That wraps it up for this evening. We'll be back here again next Monday for Part 2 of uh, Modern Methods of Analysis. My thanks again to Dr. Ron Zemian, and my thanks to all of you. If you take a moment